Uh, hello, I am uh, Professor Chad Jenkins, and welcome to Robotics 102, uh, Introduction to AI and Programming. And now we're going to cover uh, global search. So this is the lecture on, on, uh, on path planning. Uh, and, you know, we're, and, um, we're, we're inspired by, you know, by having our robots be able to, to solve mazes. And so this is, a, this is an interesting picture of a robot in a maze. And, uh, and it's trying to, um, trying to get to the, to, to the middle of this, of this maze when I have the little, little navigation dot there, the navigation pen. And so methods that we've discovered, that we've talked about thus far for doing local search and wall following, it might be able to get us there, but there's a whole class of algorithms that we want to cover now that we know can get us to that, that location uh, with guarantees and be able to do it in an optimal way, or at least generate an optimal path. And, uh, and that's what we're going to cover. And so these are going to be global search uh, techniques. And so, uh, so I took this picture from, uh, from an interesting competition that's, that's out there called the, the Micro Mouse Competition. And so these are, uh, these are uh, little robots uh, that you build and that, uh, that your team builds, and then you have to develop an algorithm to get it to, to solve a, a 16 by 16 maze. And there are some many incredible, uh, incredible um, uh, entries out there that, that I've seen. And so this is one that I saw uh, that, I, that, I, that I think is just really impressive. Uh, from about uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get to the middle of this page. So we'll see it right. That's pretty incredible to, to see see these see these robots run, and you know, and and Micro Mouse is something that's you know it's it's uh, it's a it's um, for people people participate in it all across the world. I've seen I've seen uh, competitions myself, and so Micro Mouse is pretty cool. You just do a look up on the web, and you can see uh, you can see many different Micro Mouse uh, runs, and and so it, it's really out there, and it's just it's a fun thing to do if you ever wanted to try it. Um, but if we think about our goal, if we come back to our goal for, for this class, which is to give you the power of autonomous navigation, so your robot can get from any arbitrary location, any arbitrary start location uh, to a goal location, um, you know, we, we are the algorithms we covered this far don't, may not be able to get us to, to where we need to go. And so what we want to think about is if, uh, if we have an arbitrary goal, start and goal, um, you, know, you know, we want to be able to solve something complex, um, you know, uh, um, and be able to consider anything that might be might might come on our come our way. Um, we want to maybe maybe one way we can think about it in term, from a global search perspective is that we can think of our robots navigation as solving a maze. So if we're just given something uh, complex like this, some some arbitrary, uh, you know, arbitrary structure that we have to we have to navigate, um, you know, we'd like to be able to have the robot uh, just just go through and, and solve that and, and think through what, what needs to be done in order to, to have a successful navigation. And so this is what we're gonna cover and uh, we're just uh, touch upon some, some algorithms that can allow us to perform a global search. So if we come back, just to recap um, some options that we have for navigating our robot, if we come back and think about what we've done thus far, uh, we could have our robot move around randomly. That could solve our maze. So we could just have the robot bounce all, bounce, uh, bounce all over the place, and you know, and, and you know, and eventually that robot will solve the maze. Um, but it might take a long time for it for for it to to do this. And so this, you know, this is this is one option. Maybe not our, maybe not the the option we we'd like if we if we really want to get things done in a in a purposeful way. Another approach is we could use a bug algorithm, so we could follow along the walls, uh, move towards the goal. Uh, this probably can solve our, our maze too. Um, it has some 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 strengths and weaknesses, um, and so and so it you know it and 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 uh, you know we wouldn't necessarily have to map out the the space, but we do know, need to know where our localization is. And so depending on how complex our our our, our maze is, the bug algorithm could be or could or could not be necessarily a, a, a best choice especially if we want to consider how the, the resulting path that, we, that we're, going to, we're going to traverse with the bug algorithm. 
another option we did for it was for project two, where we where we looked at uh, potential fields, and so we could build a map to guide us. We can form an attractive potential that will uh, that will that will attract us towards the goal, and then we'll put uh, repulsive potentials around the uh, around our, our obstacles so that we we don't crash into them and we're we're pushed a robot's navigation is pushed away from from the from our from our obstacles uh, from things we don't want to run into um and so if we did this if we looked at, at our potential field if we took our potential field and we uh and we tried it in this case for for our, our maze uh what uh, what what kind of path did we will we get from from our um from our our, our robot in this case so think about it, give it a second. Take a sip of my coffee right here. Um, well, most likely it's not gonna be able to solve this maze. So uh, so what we're, we'll probably get is the robot will attract towards the goal, repel off of, the, off of the wall and then maybe veer off to the left here and then get stuck. Um, this part, this thing, this, uh, concept of getting stuck is what's called a local minimum or a dead end. Um, and so, you know, so that's really where, where if you're looking at from the robot's perspective, it's, it's going down, it's doing this local search, it's optimizing, it's going down the potential. And then it gets to an area where, where it looks like everything's good. It looks like, well, you know, well, you know, it's, you know, if it, any direction the robot might want to go, it's going to introduce a higher potential. It's going to introduce a higher cost. And so really, you know, this is the best place to be in looking in its local area, but locally it might look good, but globally it did not take us to our, 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 our desired place. So it's, it's only just sort of a, sort of a small rut that we got into. And so, so our local search can, you know, it can be useful in many cases, but, but, uh, but this case is, is going to be one where we're going to end up in a, with a, with a failed search. So if we come back, you know, we still might be able to, to, to use this idea of building a map to guide us so that we can get, understand the contours of the maze and, under, and, and see where, you know, and see the extents of all this. But assuming we have that map, maybe another approach is what we, is what that we'll explore in project three is to consider all possible paths. And so if we have this map, we can sort of, you know, do a search over all possibilities so that we can, um, so that we can find a, a path that would take us from the goal to the start. And so, uh, and so, really, what we're what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a, an algorithm that can solve a maze like this, but it wouldn't be restricted to only just one maze. We should be able to to solve this maze, or uh, or just maybe a randomly generated maze that that anybody that could uh, could that could come our way. And so, I found this maze generator online that I thought was was pretty interesting. And so can we, can we develop an algorithm? Can we think through an algorithm that could, that could, that could, that could do this? And so, um, so to take some time to, you know, maybe think about, you know, how you would, how you would uh, um, create an algorithm to do this. And so one, well, somebody, one of the students, the student suggested one interesting idea, which is to just put your right hand on the wall and then just follow, follow the wall and and uh and and you know if you followed the wall that would you know that would take you around the maze and then you would you would eventually you know cover all of the you'd be able to cover all of the um all of the uh all the walls in the maze and you know and you would eventually have to run into the to the exit and that's one way to do it that that's pretty that's a pretty good idea except there might be a case where this word was but where it doesn't work where let's say you have an island in the middle and, you know, and so let's say if you came in contact with that island, you're just going to search around that same island over and over and over again. So that, that, that may not be, uh, that may be one approach that you don't want to, that you wouldn't, wouldn't want to, that should work in a number of cases, but won't work, work all the time. One approach that I thought was really interesting was actually, uh, actually in this, uh, it was, 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 is actually done by this maze generator. So, so it's actually really interesting. You could take the maze generator and you can go and you can set how many rows you want, how many columns, how many, the size of the cell, you know, and, and how long, how windy you want the paths to be. And so, you know, and so you could do that. And in addition to generating, it can solve the maze too. So if you, if you generate the maze solution, it will actually go through and, and solve this, this maze for you that it has generated. Um, and so this is, you know, and so this is, this is one, one, uh, one, one way of, of doing this. Um, 
that that you know that can generate a path uh, that that's pretty pretty good. And so, how does how do these types of algorithms work that could allow us to solve any type of maze that we've generated uh, generated randomly? Well, um, the the key idea there's two key insights. Um, is one is that we have to be able to, if we represent the map as a graph, so every location in the graph, we sort of break the graph up into, into cells, the same way we did for, for building our map in project two. And so we can represent that map as a, as a graph. Once we've represented that map as a graph, we can then develop a search algorithm that searches over that entire, entire graph. And that, would, that search of the graph would consider all possible paths. And so if we did this, Really, you know, our consideration of all, over all possible paths and the search over all of these possible paths, and then that's what, what's going to allow us to uh, to to um to find uh to find the path from a goal to a start, assuming that one of those paths exists. If we think about our checklist that we're going to have for for project three, we're going to have to do these five tasks. Fortunately, two of those are already done for you. So from project two, we've already gone through how to build a map of our envir environment. And, uh, and and use using simultaneous localization and mapping. And then we begin to build to represent our, our, our map as a graph with a grid layout. So we've computed the distance transform that be able that represents each of our each of our cells, each of our map cells as a node. And then we have connections to our um, to our to our adjacent nodes, uh, oh, connections as edges to our adjacent nodes. And we can then, we've been able to compute a distance transform of that, but now let's be able to, now we need to be able to search over possible paths. And we're gonna do that um, by, and, and when we do that, what we're really gonna do is store the, the, uh, a route, routing information at every cell back to our start location. And that routing information will tell us what's the parent along the route, what's the cell that we need to travel to next in order to, to, um, to move on our route to, towards the start. And what's going to be the distance if we followed that route that's going to that's going to lead us to that start location and we'll use a global search algorithm to find that routing at each of our cells if we're successful um, what we're going to be able to get back is a, is a path that provides a route from the goal to the start from which we can we can which we can use to then um, to then build uh to build navigation waypoints that will get us to our goal so just let me just take an example so um so um so oftentimes when you're when you're looking at micro mouse uh, people teams that compete in micro mouse uh, they generate these paths using an out using some form of what's called a flood fill algorithm um, and so flood fill was is going to go around and search through all of these paths and then once uh once the path is found um, and so this is from our start location in the lower left corner to the goal in the right I mean goal in the center I should say um, and then once, and so once the, once that path is found, the result from pathfinding will give us a, a cell to cell routing, uh, along the path. And so going from the goal, sort of emanating from the goal back to the start, the cell to cell routing is going to tell us from this cell, I need to go to this next cell. And I'm just kind of showing it here and sort of like almost treating this footsteps. Right. But like, but, but this is how we, how we're going to hop cell to cell to get from our goal, from any location along our path. <laughs> Back to the back to the start location, and for each of those locations that are along this path, we're going to be able to know the distance along the path. Uh, if we travel the, if we use this routing, the distance along the path at each cell back to our start location, and so we're going to be able to keep. Uh, we're going to store each of those numbers. Uh, that's going to be our. Um, it's going to be our routing information as the as the parent cell along the along the route and the, the distance that we're expecting for the route to take. We should remember what this graph looks like for our robot maps. And so let's just, just do a quick refresher on what our robot maps look like. And so, uh, so if we have our real world, so we're seeing our real world here over to the left, and then the, the output that we get from doing a localization mapping could look, uh, look roughly like what you're seeing here on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, and so that that um, so this so we've been able to map this in, environment, noting that the that the white cells in our in our slam map are the unoccupied space. The black cells are are cells that are occupied, and the gray cells are the cells that we um that uh, that are that we don't know anything about. They're uncertain at this point, and so we're going to treat those as occupied because we don't because there might be something there and there might not be something there. 
And so once we have this, we're going to store this in our, in our program as a vector over, over robot, a vector of cells over robot locations. And then every cell is going to be, is going to be represented by a node in our, in our graph. Um, and so that, that's going to store, each, each cell is going to store, um, you know, the, the location of the, of the, uh, of, of the point in sort of the overall map coordinates. Uh, it will say it will have store information like whether the cell is occupied or not, and other information that we're going to need in order to perform our, our search. And so this is just in, uh, this is just important things that we store about this cell. And then we should also note that every pair of neighboring cells uh, will share an edge in the in the graph. And so these will be uh, this will um, so between our between our, our neighboring cells, we're just going to connect them with an edge. Um, noting that we can, there, there are oftentimes two different types of, of connectivity that we, that we're going to have in our, um, in our, in our, in our, um, in our graph. So for my example that I'm going to show here, I'm going to use what are called four connected neighborhoods. Um, and so that means that every, every cell is connected to its north, south, east, and west neighbor or up, down, left, right. Um, and so this is, this is, um, this doesn't include our diagonal neighbors. Uh, which are good, which would be our which would lead if we did that would lead to our eight connected neighborhood um, and so those would be all the all the neighbors that are in the in a, in in the um, in the square around the around the current cell and so if we did that if we include those diagonals we get an an eight connected neighborhood um, and so there are pros and cons to 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 both four connected and eight connected so. Um, so in the, in, you know, in, because we have an Omni drive robot, you know, we could move in any direction. We shouldn't be, we don't have to be restricted to four connected. Um, but then if we, if we use, uh, if we use eight connected, then, you know, then we should note that we're going to have, uh, we're, you know, we could have different, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's going to look different. Um, it's going to take you longer actually to get to along the diagonals. Than to move uh, on on the side because that's just you know that's that's just what the Pythagorean theorem tells us, and so there's pros and cons to to both. Um, I would just give a quick tangent, um, and I'm not going to go into too much depth of this, but I just would ask why are hexagons the best of gods? And so um, um, and so uh, so I would uh, so I'm just showing this vi this visual here. There was a fabulous video. Uh, online about it but um but if you want to think about it you know if i'm trying to do uh, if i'm trying to do path plan if i'm trying to do path planning or represent my my map as a grid maybe hexagons are the best of gons and so i would love to hear your thoughts on this the next time you uh next time we we see you see me in uh, in class or lab or something like that but moving on so one thing that we have to note is that uh, that each of, at each of our cells now we need to, so in addition to storing the location and whether the cell is occupied, we need to also store information for our, for our, for our planning. Uh, and so for our, for, for routing information and for our, along our path, that means we have to store the parent of each node along the, along the start, along the, um, along the, the, the path. Um, so this is the routing parent. And we also need to store the path distance if we take that route um, and what our expected distance is going to be. So we need to include, we need to expand our structure at the cell to include this information. So if we, if we did this, um, what would a flood fill look like to compute a, uh, to compute the parent and distance for, for each node? And so let's consider, you know, let's consider we, there's, there's a number of ways that we could do this, but let me, let me build on one potential idea that I think is, 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 uh, that is, is sort of uh, a, a, um, what I want to explore in, in this example, which is let's grow outward from the node at the start location and just expand our consideration more and more, building outward from from some from from just sort of growing out our consideration of nodes, uh, moving moving um, moving almost like a, as a wave front uh, across our across the free areas of our of our map, and so if we did this, we would then start at the we, we begin at the start of our uh, start location. So that's where the robot currently is. And this will be the root of our search graph. And so the root of a, of a, of a, of a graph, it will not, it, this, this doesn't have any parents to it. So that means it's, a, it's, it's the root. Um, it, is the, it is just our starting location. And that start location is gonna have no parent and no distance because the distance from the start from itself is zero. 
once we do this, we're going to then visit all the, the so we're going to, um, so all the neighbors of our, of our start node are going to be visited. So we're going to, we're going to consider each of those. And so we're considering a four connected neighborhood. So it's the, the north, south, east, and west neighbors. And so we're going to, we're going to look at each of those. And then we're going to assign a distance to each of these, uh, to each of these neighbors. And that's going to be one plus the smallest distance that 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 we've uh, that we've in, that we've assigned to a cell at this point. And so, so right now, the smallest distance that we've assigned to anything has been zero. And then, uh, and then we're going to add one to that, and that's we're going to assign to all of our of our neighbors that we're visiting right now. And that's going to lead a, that's going to that's going to put a one in there. So then we're going to do the same thing with those neighbors. So the ones that we just that we just visited. Well, let's consider the neighbors of those uh, of those of those cells. And so if we did that, we get this. Uh, we get the the cells that we see here. So they, these are the neighbors of all the of all the place of all the cells that we've just visited. And so we're going to do the same thing, in that we're going to assign one plus the smallest distance to each of those. So the smallest distance that we've in, that we've assigned in this in, up to this point has been one. And so for all these neighbors that we're now visiting, we're going to we're going to add one plus that, which is going to be two. And then we're going to sign those sign that in those cells. We'll do the same thing for the neighbors of those of those cells that we've just visited. And then we'll and then so we have this. Uh, so for those, we're going to assign a three into um, in, in, into those cells. We'll repeat this again, this loop again. And we'll then um, we'll then assign all the elements for uh, for distance four, five, six, seven, and we're going to move outward. And so what you're seeing is just sort of this this wave front that's that's coming out. Um, that's you know that's that's being able to essentially uh, establish the the frontier of, of of our exploration, and then extend that one by one cell further, um, and then we expand this frontier and we keep going. Uh, until our until our um, until our, our wave front right here, uh, then um, then be able is able to to reach the reach the goal location, um, and so once we've reached the 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 goal, then we can um, then we can uh, we we can then perform a local search. Uh, so the local search that we talked about in in the for our last project, we can then do that from our from our goal location, and then just uh, and then just step. Uh, step down uh, from that local search, and that will that will give us a path that will provide us a connecting path that connects our goal to the start location. Note that, that you don't necessarily get one. There's not necessarily one right path that the local search could have. Uh, there's there's a number of different paths that that would that could result. I just chose one and a particular one in this case. Once we do this, we can then um, once we've est established this. Uh, this uh, this local search and this ordering of uh, of cells that we that we're traversing, we can then assign parents uh, along this path in the decreasing order of the of the values that we're they're encountering from the local search, and then from these parents we can we you know from that traversal we can then form a list of navigation waypoints. Uh, so each of these cells would then would then give us um, would then give us a route that we could follow. Um, uh, a, a collection of waypoints that our robot can can then uh, can then traverse in order to get to our to our goal, and that is a is a very very simple way for us to to generate a uh, to 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 do path planning in our in our route. Um, now, one thing that you should note, um, you know this you know you might like this this might be this might be a good route. Um, there's one thing that that gives me a little bit of concern with this route. Compared to what we generated for our for our distance transform, um, and so th it's really this area, this area right here, um, you know, this area. I'm going to just draw this right here. So this area right here, you know, that's a good thing in that I, you know, if I want to if I want to minimize my distance from the start to the goal, then I'm going to cut that corner as close as possible. But I may not want to cut that corner as close as possible. I might instead want to, you know, give myself a little bit more space and then come out here. Um, we can talk about ways to do that, but, you know, but that is sort of, you know, that our distance transform that we had from project two does have some benefits um, and that it can keep us away from, from maybe uh, from dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, um, sections right here. And so, you know, that is uh, that is a pro and a con of of the method that we've discussed thus far.
so this whole algorithm uh, comes together, and uh, and so this is this is basically saying, well, if we if we want to do our global search, this is one way to to do this, and this algorithm is uh, is called uh, is, is called the brush fire algorithm, and so we can we so if we if we follow this this path, you know, this uh, this pseudo code would 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 uh, would basically get us to this point where we start from the begin from the start node, visit the neighbors of the nodes we've just visited. Assign each one to the to uh, one plus the smallest distance. We keep repeating that over and over and over until we reach our goal. And once we reach our goal, we perform local search, and then uh, and then form our navigation waypoints. There is there are a couple a couple things I, I didn't say about this. Um, and so one of those is is that how do we keep track of our nodes that we've that we visited? Um, so, you know, so we just kind of magically said, let's visit these nodes, but how do we actually do that? Um, and, uh, and so there's, uh, there's one, one structure that allows us to, to sort of do this in a, in a pretty nice way. And that's, uh, that's using a queue data structure. So our queue data structure is, uh, is a first in first out data structure. So that means we, you know, so, so when you put things into the queue, the first element that the uh, an element that put is, is that is put on first will be the first one that we get that we can retrieve from the from the data structure, um, and so this is different than other data structures. There's another data structure called the stack, which is a last uh, last in first out. So the last element you put in will be the first one you you take out. But let me talk about the queue. So the queue means uh, in our data structures that we're gonna that when we when we want to put something onto it, we we enqueue it, and that enqueue goes into the back of the data structure. And then we want to take things off. We're going to dequeue. We're going to pull something off from the front of the data structure. And so to give a sense of how this works, one thing I can do is enqueue element A. So that's let's say that's our first element that we that we enqueue. And then I can enqueue a, a few more. So let's say I enqueue element B, and then I enqueue element C right here. Now, if I want to take an take an element off of the of the queue, I have to take element A first because that was the first one that we put on. So if I dequeue, I'm going to take element A off. Then if I want to dequeue again, actually I'm going to enqueue. Now, this, now I'm going to enqueue element D, and so so now I have three elements in my in my queue. If I want to dequeue at this point, I have to take element B because that was the first one of those elements that were there that, that came out. If I dequeue again, I would dequeue element C. Then I can enqueue element, element E here. And this can go on, you know. And so, but basically it just means whatever gets enqueued first has to be the first thing, uh, has to be the first thing dequeued. So if we take this Q data structure. And we apply it to our uh, apply it to our example. Then what's going to happen is, is we're going to uh, if, and we start here from our, our root node again. What's going to happen is we're going to have all of our neighbors. So if we have each of our neighbors of of our of our of our start node right here, um, we're going to enqueue them a one at a time. So element A right here, which is going to be our north, giving it label A. We're going to enqueue that one first, and we have to sort of choose an order of how we're going to enqueue our neighbors. So I'm going to go north, then east, then south, then west. And so each of these will, will be enqueued. Once we do that, we can, uh, we, as we're doing that, we can assign them to the distances, their proper distances uh, from, the start from the start node. And then once we, then we can repeat this by then dequeuing our next element, which is gonna be element A, which is gonna be our north, North neighbor, and we're going to repeat the same process for this neighbor, in that we're going to consider, um, and uh, I'm going to skip that, and then we're going to consider the the neighbors of this node, um, and so the neighbors of this node will be the north, south, I mean the north, east, and west neighbors. We don't want to re-enqueue, uh, uh, we don't want to re-enqueue elements or revisit elements, so we're not going to we're not going to re-enqueue our start node. So, uh, so this, so this node will be will will not be considered. We won't re requeue that one. So, so we don't have to do that. But once we do that, we can then enqueue our neighbors, starting from the north, the east, and now the the west element. And so, and then we can assign the proper distances in those those areas because it's going to be one plus 
the distance of the of the current of the node that we're currently processing. And then um, and then once we do that, then node A has been completely processed and uh, and we can move on. At that point, we will then DQ our element, uh, our, our next element, which will be element B, and we'll repeat this process over and over and over. And that will that will get us the that will then uh, get us the the um the be the 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 search pro the search pattern that we saw before and, and lead us to to finding an, uh finding the path between the start and the goal. Um and so two potential conditions could occur. We could do as I said, we could reach the reach the goal, and if we did that, then we found a viable path. If we get to the point that our queue is becomes empty, we can't dequeue another element off of it because. We, because we we've run out, that means our search has failed, and we don't have uh, we and we didn't we weren't able to find a path, and so uh, so in this case that means that a path does not exist in our graph. So um, so at that point we've been able to keep keep track of of these nodes uh, using our queue data structure. One thing that we should note is that when we perform this this search, uh, this global search, the the part that we're that we're looking at up here. Uh, that 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 the point of this is just to estimate the distances along the path, and then once we estimate those distances, then we do this local search in order to assign the parents and actually generate the generate the routes. But the question is, is do we have to keep those separate? Do we have to do a separate local search? Maybe we can do both of those things together: assign, generate the parent, the routing parents, and the distances along the path, along the path we're looking to find, and do those in do those in, in one process. And so we can do that um, because brush fire is just one of several algorithms that could perform a flood fill. There's depth for search algorithms. There's Dijkstra's algorithms if you're, if you're going more into your data structures. Uh, what I'm going to talk about now is a breadth for search algorithm as a, as a way to do this. Um, one thing I didn't tell you about the brush fire algorithm that also applies for breadth for search is that we have to keep track at every cell now of which elements, which elements of which um, for or for each of our cells, we have to keep track of whether it's uh, whether that that node has been visited previously and whether that node has been queued previously. So now we have to expand our data structure to consider um, to consider uh, Boolean values for visited and queued for our for each of our elements. And so if we can do this. Then we can uh, then we basically can build out a breadth first search algorithm right here, um, and so you can see so I've so it's there's a lot here so I'm gonna um, so I, I've tried to color code it. Um, when you see my choices of color coding, you realize why I'm a computer scientist, <laughs> not a not a not um, not somebody with design sensibilities. But uh, but you know but hopefully you can see the breakdown of the algorithm. Um, and so uh, so for breadth first search, what we like what we should do is is in going through this, let's instead of trying to absorb all of this to, at, at once, let's just take this piece by piece. And so let's start with our initialization. So to initialize, what we want to be able to do is have all of our is to assign uh, assign all of our nodes. So if we take all of our nodes in our in our in our map right here, and we assume that, uh, and so I'm going to use this dash to represent some very large number. You can interpret that as infinity if you want to. As, as as sort of the maximum floating point value, I would not recommend using that, by the way. Um, but or maybe just you know a number that is just you know larger than than really can be supported by your map because you know because because you just want to make sure that that's just you know that's just saying it's it's a very high number, right? And so we're going to assume that then in this case all pair all nodes have no parent, this maximum distance, and e in each is marked as unvisited. So we're just going to mark every cell as this in, in, in this in this case. Um, our start node, if we want to consider our start node, our start node is going to be is going to have no parent, but we already know the distance of the start node from itself, and so it's well, so it will be zero. And because of the start location, it will it will be the the center. It'll be the root of where where our search uh, where our search is going to so going to start. And because of that, we can um, we can. We can um, we can initialize our visit queue with the start node as its only enqueued element, and so our visit queue is going to start with the the start node there. Once we have that, we can then uh, we can then do our iteration. 
this iteration again will occur while the visit list remains um, re remains not empty because if the visit list becomes empty and we try to we're trying to pull from that that means our search has failed um, and we're also going to continue this iteration while <clears throat> while the um, while the cur node currently visited is not the goal so we're going to continue until we we reach the goal and and, and the first step of, of all of our iterations uh, towards towards our search is going to dequeue the current node and mark it as visited. And so in this case, we're going to then, what we're going to do, <clears throat> what that means is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to dequeue from our, from our, from our visit node. And that will be our current node that we pull off. And we're going to now process that, that current node <clears throat> and advance our search. So for each of the, of the neighbors of this, of our current node, we're going to, we're going to enqueue each of those, each of those neighbors onto our visit queue assuming that they haven't been previously visited or queued themselves. <clears throat> so if we're looking at, uh, if we're looking at our, our current node, assuming that we have the order of doing north, east, west, and south, or north, what, east, south, and then west, we're gonna take our, 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 our neighbor to the north and we're gonna, and we're gonna enqueue that first neighbor. So this is gonna be, I'm just giving this label cell A and we're going to enqueue cell A onto, onto our visit queue. That's the first step in our in our iteration. Now, what, as we've queued this this element onto the as we as we're, as we're queuing this this element, we want to assign a, a distance uh, to this neighbor, and we're going to ask ourselves: Does the route that currently exists for this neighbor, and the distance that that's in this that's that's stored for this route, is that better than the route that our parent could provide to us? This new parent could provide to us, and if it is. If if the if the if the route that that's offered by the parent is better, let's update our routing to use that that this current node instead. Um, and so, that really is this question that we have here. So this is where we're going to update our parents and our distances as as we perform the search. And so, if we're looking in this case for our for our current element, um, the distance of the neighbor is just going to be some really high value because we've established no route for, for, for this case. So let's just consider this as being infinity, right? Um, and then the route that's offered by the current node, if it is chosen to be the parent, is going to be the distance of that node, which is currently set as zero, plus the cost to move from, the, from that current node to the neighbor, which is going to be one in this case. And so if we consider those, those two things together, that means that infinity, that it is true that infinity is greater than zero plus one. And that means we should update to use our, to use this current node as the, as our routing parent. And so because this is true, then we're gonna update the, the, the neighbor to, um, to, to use the parent as its current node. So I just drew a little arrow from the neighbor to, to, the, to the parent node right here. And then we're also going to update the distance of the neighbor to be the distance of the current node plus the cost to move. And so the distance of the current node is zero. The cost to move between the cells is going to be one. And then that's going to give us one as the distance that we're going to store at, the, at, at our neighbor. And so at that point, uh, we've, we've enqueued, uh, we've, fully, we've fully processed uh, this element. So now we're going to do the same thing for for each of our each of our neighbors. And so if we're looking at our at our second neighbor, so we're going to enqueue our second neighbor that's on uh, that's that's on the on the right over here. We're going to enqueue that one, and then we're going to assign the distance and parent, assuming you know doing the same comparison that we that we made before to see do we, does this does this current node offer a better route back to the start. Excuse me. We'll do the same thing for our third neighbor, which is to the which is below. We'll enqueue, and then determine whether we need to update and assign in terms of our assigning our distance and parent. We'll do this again for our last neighbor. We'll enqueue and assign the distance and parent. Once this happens, once we've processed all of our neighbors, our current node is fully processed. And we can, uh, and we can, we can, we don't have to consider it anymore. And then we can, um, we can dequeue from the visit queue to process our next neighbor, which is going to be 
the element element A right here, which is going to be just above our start node. When we're processing this current node, we will then consider its neighbor, uh, its its neighbor one above, which is going to be which is going to be the first element that we that we queue here. And then we're going to assign its distance and parent, which is going to be two. And then we're also going to, um, and it, the current node offers a better route, so we will we will um, we will make it the parent along this route. We'll do the same thing for the second neighbor. And then it will get a distance and parent. We will not do it for the third neighbor because it's already been visited. So, so our start node that we've already seen, we don't have to enqueue that one. So we're going to skip that one. And then we'll enqueue our last neighbor and assign it a distance and parent. And so at that point, once we've processed all the neighbors, uh, this node is uh, this node is, is fully processed, and we can mark and, and, and it is visited, and we can move on. Once we're at this point, we can then take element B off of the visit queue, and then the process will continue, and it will move forward in a sam in a manner similar to what we already saw with the uh, with the brush fire algorithm, except that we were going to be able to assign parents along the way. Um, I could sort of work through this entire example and, you know, and I had visions of like working through all the parents and, and distances. Um, it's a lot of work to do that. It's a lot. There's a lot. So I got, I, I, I got lazy and I just said, let me find something online that can, that can compute a, a star and breath first search. And so I found, um, I found this really nice, uh, really nice calculator uh, a star calculator and I took the I took the uh, the map that we produced and I and I entered it into this a to to this uh, and so so this is this is what it looks like and uh, and then instead of using a star I, I chose breath first search and uh, and I chose the breath first search and this is this is what it what it what it produced it looks very similar to what we did for our brush fire flood fill the only thing that's different is you'll note that we have our that um, that what's what's interesting is you can see that that in addition to all the cells that are visited here in blue, it also um, it also kept track of the cells that are currently in the queue. So these cells that are currently in the queue, which I'm marking right here, are uh, are are in green. And so um, and so those cells right there are ones that. So you can see that the queue is sort of on the on the edge as well. And so so those are those are elements that are that are queued. And so um, and so this is really how how breath first search works. Um, you know, it looks very much like our like, like our brush fire, um, but um, but it gets to some considerations that that we should that we should that we can that we can use. And brush, I should also say, breath first search will be good enough for our for our um, for project three. You know, this really should be. You know, uh, this is this is something we believe uh, it will produce a, a good route for you. Um, and you know you should think about you know for this breath for search you know is any path that reaches the the goal a good path well you know I mean you know is is this a, is as we sort of talked about is is this what we really want in the end you know if you're thinking about path length we can assert we can uh, we can already assert that we're going to get the shortest path in terms of distance using breath first search because we're always explore we're always expanding out our frontier and so. So if, if distance is all we want, then we're going to get something that is going to that we can consider to be optimal. But there might be other considerations that we might want to cons consider, like the geometry of the robot, how many turns we're making, you know, the windiness of it, the jerkiness of it. Uh, but you know, for this class, distances can be can be good enough. We should also ask ourselves how many cells do we have to visit in order to make this happen? Are we you know are we searching as efficiently as possible? And if we did, you know, if, if we're taking this in consideration, maybe there's other visit strategies that would actually produce uh, a, a, a more efficient result. So if we, if we, if we, if we have these considerations in mind, um, we can go back to breath first search, but if we went into this, uh, if we went into this, uh, into, this uh, in, into this little, into this application, and instead of doing breath first search, we did a star, you could see that we get uh, we could get a very similar result. In fact, the length you know the the, the path may, is is essentially the same distance. They're both length thirty eight, um, but a star you can see you know visits many fewer nodes. 
Um, you, it's not, it does, it doesn't have the, the need to explore, you know, all of this area out here. Whoops. whoops. Let me go back. So all of this area out here, you know, all of this, all of these, these locations right here don't, are not, uh, are not searched by the, by the robot, right? We don't, and so we, I mean, it's almost like you're, we're cutting it, you know, like, like almost a third or a half of the, the nodes are not even having to be considered and we're still getting a shortest path. And so, so this is a much more, and so as the, as the size of your, your map grows, right, to maybe the size of a building, a room, a building, uh, a city, you know, this is, this is a real big savings that you're, that you're gonna wanna have. And so the question one might ask is, you know, how did ASTAR do this? How did ASTAR generate a shortest path while visiting many fewer nodes? And, um, and the act actually the answer to this is, is pretty simple. It's not, you know, you're just a, just a, a relatively small tweaking of our breadth first search algorithm can actually lead to, to this, uh, this very improved uh, result. And so if we go back to breadth first search, um, the only thing that we're changing from breadth first search to what we want to get with a star is all we're doing is changing our our queue to from being a first in first out queue to being a priority queue where where essentially the it's it doesn't really matter what order the um what order elements are put onto the priority queue the thing that matters is the priority we assign to that to each of these elements and you know, and so that priority is decides when when we're going to pull it pull it off the, off of the queue. And so, if we're going to use a priority queue and we're going to do a star search, um, there's two main questions we have to ask: How do we implement a priority queue? Because we haven't talked about that at all. And how do we determine a node's priority for in in terms of an a star search? Um, and so, for both of these questions, um, I'm going to kind of to say. The implementation of priority queue is a topic for later courses in data structures. So if you're going to take ECS 280 at Michigan, you know they'll talk about uh, they'll talk about priority queues, or maybe it's 281, one of those. Um, but if I'm going to foreshadow and you want to get ahead of the curve, if you want to, you can use a binary heap. A binary heap data structure essentially stores all of your data so that you can always get the the highest priority element at the is, is going to be at the top. And, uh, and so I'll save that for later. But if you want to get ahead of this, you can consider it an advanced extension for project three. You do not have to do it, but, but I think it's just helpful to, to see this. The second question was going to be, what is a node's priority for A star? How do we decide a priority so that if we, if we put it onto this heap structure or we, we, you know, we can find it, uh, that we can be able to get access to, to that element and then, and then be able to DQ that that highest priority element for a star. And so the, the, simp, the way we're gonna do this is by using a, what, what's called an optimistic heuristic that's gonna give us, that, that's gonna assume that, you know, from wherever the, the node is right now, what's the best possible outcome, you know, for in terms of the length of the path. And so if we said, you know, let's take, let's take you know, we're gonna consider for a given node, what's the current distance along the path back to the start, and what is the best possible distance that we could get moving forward to get to the goal? We combine those two together, and that is what we add. Just add those two together, um, and that perform that gives us our um, our pri the priority we're going to assign to each of our each of our elements. So let's take a look and see what this what 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 this would just give some examples of what this priority would look like. Um, so let's consider uh, a node, the node at, at this particular location. Um, for that node, we have to make sure, now we have, uh, we have to expand our notion of, uh, of it for the node, we have to expand the, what we're storing in the, in the cell struct, in the cell structure. So in, a dist in addition to the parent and the distance, we also have to add, we have to consider the priority. For a star, we're gonna consider this priority to be what's called an F score. Um, so the F score will be, will be the, the priority that we assign to this node. And so I'm just going to note the, pri the, the priority. By the time we get to this, this point, so you're seeing the search that after it's all, all done, but let's say that we're just, we're trying to enqueue this node at, at, at this point. 
then by the point, the time we're, we're considering this node to be, to be queued, um, it will already have a route back to the start. It will be, it will, it will, we will be able to assign a route back to the start because it will have some neighbor node that will, that, that will, that will be assigned as the, as the routing parent back to the start. And there will be a distance that will be assigned to the that will be assigned for that route that we we've been able, been able to compute. And that distance was what we're that path distance back to the to start is going to be considered the G score. And so that G score is going to be is going to be the current route back to the to the start. And that's going to be given by the by the dot distance value in the struct. Similarly, there was going to be an H score. An H score is going to be the lowest possible distance to the goal, regardless of collisions. So if we are, so if let's so let's assume that we we had no collisions at this at the point where we have a almost a clear path to the goal, what we what that means is we want to focus our search on those areas that are going to get us closer to the goal. We don't want to have to consider all of these other areas. So so you know so these areas that are you know that are back over here in this area or over here to the side that are not taking us to the goal, we don't want to consider those areas. That's not, that's not where we want to put our search. If we, that, that's not where we want to spend our time if we don't have to. We want to be goal focused and we want to say, you know, let's assume that there's nothing in our way. Let's just go in that direction. And so that's what A star is really going to, will do in this case. And that's why it's, it's, it's by, that's why the search is being biased towards the goal and we can we can still generate a shortest path without having to um, without having to to move towards the towards our, our um, without having to to you know to spend extra effort to visit di different places. And so this is really you know this so if we take these two uh, we two take these two scores the G score and the H score and we combine them to the F and we assign that to priority we put that priority into uh, into a priority queue so. So the so that the next element that's going to be dequeued will be the highest priority. We go visit that one and we continue our loop. Then that's what gives us a star search. If we look at at other at other cases, so so if we consider a node at this location, and so in this case, you know, we can have our path back to the start. We're still going to consider. It's important to note that our H score is going to be the lowest possible distance, regardless of collisions. So we're not considering any collisions there. We're just saying what's the quickest Manhattan distance. If we're using a connected, you know, if we're using, we this could easily be, um, you know, Euclidean distance if we wanted. If we just want the straight line from the goal to the start, either way of the either one of those can can work. Um, and so we can consider the the location of at this node. Uh, so this is just showing what the F score would look like, the G score, the H score, and the F score in this case. If we're considering a node that's currently being queued, we could get a G score and H score that look like this. Um, and so this is just showing some a few examples of what of what this would look like. Um, you know, and so so this is our heuristic that assigns the priority. So if we're going to use something like breath first search or A star search or any of these global search methods. Can you think of a robot that plans paths using using one of these methods? Let me take a sip real quick. Well, the the simple answer is that you know pretty much everything I talked about <laughs> from uh, you know in the in the beginning of of class use it can will oftentimes use some form of of a star search. Maybe not all of these, but but you know but you know but a star it tends to be the workhorse of the way that we, we do autonomous navigation. And so, um, and so this is really, you know, th this is, you know, anything that you could think of is gonna do something like A star search or some form of global search so they can, so it can find, find routing. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to any search method. And so one of the, the great things about A star is that you get a complete algorithm, which means it guarantees a correct answer um, you know, so that's what algorithmic completeness uh, means. Um, you know, either either search will fail or you will get a correct correct answer. And so, so completeness is is something that that is uh, that is valued. You can also get an optimal path, right? So usually it's the shortest shortest path distance, but it could be other areas of optimality. But we're going to minimize cost in uh, in some form. The, the, the downside of, of getting optimality and completeness is that 
is that now this is very expensive, not just expensive in terms of the amount of computation that's used, but you need a full slam map and you know, full observation of your entire, of your entire um, area, um, of your entire map. Um, you know, and then it's, it's also uh, you know, responsiveness. So, you know, so if, uh, if the map changes or your, your localization changes, right, you have to recompute everything. And so, so that responsiveness, so it's hard to react in real time. Um, you know, if you think about your wall follower, you know, you can, we can just throw things in front of your wall follower, you know, um, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, you know, if we use a blog algorithm or random walk, you know, just think about your Roomba, you know, it just, you know, you put something on the ground, it just bounces right off of it. Um, you, you lose uh, some reaction, you'll lose considerable reaction time in terms of responsiveness, but you get something that can adapt to very, to many different situations. So if we consider all of these possibilities, um, you know, and so, so, you know, so these are, so we consider all the options that we've covered for, for navigating our robot. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of look at them as our, as our different algorithms that we've covered. Um, these exist uh, along a spectrum of reaction and deliberation. So, so, you know, so if we, if we sort of broke it down, what happens in, you know, is, is that we have sort of gone from, you know, from thinking about the most reactive cases where, where it's just reacting in the moment, reacting to its current circumstance, and just, just doing something from there, and and not really thinking through the possibilities. And we've covered, we've gone all the way to cover, con consider completely deliberative systems that have to think through everything before taking an action. And so it gives us something that's going to be that, that's going to be very thorough, but is also, you know, it's going to take much longer to respond. Uh, and so this, so if you're looking at all of these algorithms, they all have their, their pros and cons going from something that is, you know, the simple and cheap um, and, you know, it can be made robust to something that is, you know, that is complete, optimal, thorough, but, you know, but slow to respond. And so this really gets us to our, our reaction deliberation trade-off. And so each of these is, you know, has, has pros and cons. And there's, there's a number of algorithms along this entire spectrum between reaction and deliberation. And so, so you should consider a number of trade-offs. Uh, nothing is going to be, there's no one right, right answer. And so there's always going to be these trade-offs that we face in terms of our search algorithm where, where you know, where we're, where we're, where we're, where we're trading off uh, the overhead, you know, minimizing the amount of overhead we have to implement something and, and the and you know all the infrastructure that's around it um, versus something that's going to be going to be optimal, right? Which is something that's going to give us um, that's going to give us you know a, a, an optimal solution, um, whether that's where we're trying to optimize for 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 cost, like like financial cost in terms of putting together, or or we're trying to optimize for um, for you know for the completeness of the solution that we get back, the complete, completeness of our path. Um, we should think about, you know, the speed of our system, how fast do we want it to react versus uh, the guarantees that we can get uh, from our system. Do we want something that's going to be simple and that, that's going to react, react really quickly? Or do we need thoroughness and, and we, need, um, we need to be able to know to promise what, what the behavior of the systems is going to be? And then there's also the responsiveness to the environment. You know, are, are you working in a highly dynamic space? You know, if you're going to have autonomous cars on the road, they have to be, they have to respond pretty quickly. And so you have to think about, you know, how it's going to react, but you also want it to be adaptable in that, um, in that if, you know, if their roads condition, if, the, if, you know, if, the, if you have to generate a new route for some reason, um, you want to consider any possible new, any possible new, um, new goal location, um, you know, you want it to, to be able to adapt to, to circumstances, circumstances, not be able to uh, not have to um, to get stuck making the same mistakes over and over and over, and so this you know so there are trade offs between all of the all of these algorithms. Um, there is no right one algorithm, and there we've only covered sort of like the beginning you know the starting point of for for exploring these algorithms, these search algorithms for autonomous navigation. There's a larger world of possibilities out there that you should consider, um, and so I'm just. So one thing that we did, so we, in this class, we use LCM, lightweight communications and marshalling. So that's, that's what you're seeing. Uh, there's also something called ROS, which is called uh, the robot operating system, which is actually only one of many op robot operating systems. Um, and so, but if you look in, in, in that, you see the sort of navigation setup that's used in, in ROS. Um, then, you know, 
then what you're actually seeing is is what we've covered are in the, in this class is is the is is really the um you know the you know the way that that things are are structured in, in sort of your professional uh, autonomous navigation system you'll see that they have global planners and local planners usually the job of the global planner is to lay out the navigation waypoints and then the local planner's job is to get you from waypoint to waypoint um, and so you know and so this is really so what we've covered are the the baseline algorithms that you would use in really your 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 in, in a in a professional navigation uh, uh, setup. And so this is really just the, the, the where this could go. And if you wanna know more, robot operating system, ross.org is out there. You can see the many different types of robots and the different types of uh, software architecture that are used to, to implement these algorithms. Um, if you want to see where this can go in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of courses, so we you know we I we will we are on track to offer a robotics major as of fall 2022, um, and so this but I but it is a draft. We this is still pending approvals. This is still um, th there's still a number of things that have to have to go right. But hopefully, fingers crossed, the world you know the stars will align and, and be able to. To make uh, you know to make this uh, to make this uh, a, a possibility, but this is sort of the draft layout. But if you want to if you want to study more in this, there are two courses that that really would be be great. In that there's Robotics 320, Robot Operating Systems, which is going to study planning and modeling for mobile manipulation robots. So if you want to extend this beyond navigation to robots that could move and pick up stuff and work and 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 um, uh, pick pick up things and work with objects and in, uh, in various environments, that's where we scale this up to think about robot arms and and uh, those types of systems. And then, if you want to build a slam system of your own, there's Robotics 330, um, and so that really is where you where you know you don't have to use the slam system; you are going to make your own. And so this is this is building out to the this curriculum. And so this really and this is at this point we have done. Uh, we have covered autonomous navigation. You are, you know, you are at this point are ready to do autonomous navigation and develop uh, develop path planning algorithms. And so, I wish you success with with Project Three. And thank you for for taking time to listen to me. All right.